Okay, moving uh, the schedule along, the next company presenting is Skeena Resources. They're developing the SK Creek project in British Columbia's Golden Triangle region, targeting annual production of over 350,000 gold equivalent ounces. Skeena also owns the historic Snip Mine, which is being advanced under an earn-in agreement with Hawkchilds. And uh, we're going to welcome Executive Chairman Walter Coles to present. Thanks, Andrew, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. We'll just leap right in here if I can figure out. There we go. Okay. So skeena has got two, two projects in the northwestern area of British Columbia, commonly referred to as the Golden Triangle. It's an area that has a, uh, a very prestigious, long history of uh, incredible mineral discoveries and mines being permitted and put into production. Skeena's two assets are the SK Creek, uh, former underground uh, gold-silver mine, and also the, uh, a smaller uh, asset called SNP. We optioned both of these past-producing mines from Barrick back in 2015 and 17. Uh, we've since exercised those options and uh, own them 100% with the caveat, of course, that Hochschild is earning in on our smaller uh, SNP uh, property. Both of these assets are in the, the Taltan territory. You can see that, that's the, the large pink area. Uh, the Taltan First Nation are a, uh, a nation that, that uh, I think consider themselves to be a mining nation. Uh, they were mining obsidian thousands of years ago and, and so it's very much in their, their culture and, and we view them as our, our partners on these projects and they're a great, uh, uh, great group of people to be to be working with. I won't go into all the, the management team, but I, I will mention uh, Randy Reichert, who's here with me today. Uh, Randy took on the CEO role last last fall. Uh, really excited to have him at the helm of Skeena. The company's going through a bit of a transition as we move from being a junior exploration company into development and construction. And those are the skills that that Randy uh, brings to the team. Uh, he was previously with B2 Gold where he was uh, part of the leadership team that built the Fakola mine in Mali. Uh, a mine that I should add was built on time and on budget and we're uh, expecting the same kind of uh, outcome with the SK Creek project under Randy's uh, leadership. One of the wonderful things about brownfield assets is that a lot of the infrastructure is already in place. So when SK was being built, uh, a road was put in from Highway 37 uh, typically in this area, uh, exploration projects are, are remote. You need helicopters to get to them. That's not the case with SK Creek. Uh, we've, got, we've got camps, we've got uh, roads we can use all year round. Uh, it's a tremendous advantage, but probably the, the biggest uh, sort of change since these mines operated back in the 90s and early 2000s are those three blue teardrops on the uh, map in front of you. Those are three new hydroelectric facilities that were built over the last seven years. Uh, at a cost of about $2 billion US. SK Creek is 17 kilometers away from one of those, uh, uh, the, the, the blue teardrop on the right. So that's a game changer from when these projects operated uh, 20 years ago. They were powered by diesel and propane. And I've been told that in certain months when the price of oil was over $100 a barrel, the energy cost represented over 50% of the OPEX. Now with uh, cheap, clean hydropower, we're projecting that energy will represent less than 5% of our operating costs. So a massive uh, uh, game changer. And, and, and I'd also add that it, it shields the company from the volatility of, of oil prices because we're able to plug into hydro uh, power and, and hopefully we'll uh, end up with electric trucks and, and really shield ourselves from uh, that kind of commodity price risk on the cost side. Uh, I'd also add that we did an acquisition last year that allowed us to pick up the Kingpin and KSP properties. That took our land holdings in this area to 100,000 hectares. From uh, prior to that, it was around 12,000 hectares. So we, we really have a district scale uh, land package here. I think the only other companies that have a bigger uh, land package in the Golden Triangle are Tech, uh, Newcrest, and Newmont. Um, so we've got lots of, of room to spread our wings and, and continue to do exploration. 
SK Creek was a, a legendary mine, and, and th these are the production stats uh, from 1994 to 2008. SK produced 3.3 million ounces of gold, 160 million ounces of silver. But the, the truly astounding part is, is in that, that mini, middle column. You see that the grade was 45 grams per ton gold and, and over 2,000 grams per ton silver. On a gold equivalent basis, that's about two and a half ounces per ton. I don't know of any mine in the world today that, that has that kind of grade. It's, it's truly uh, spectacular. Uh, you can see that when Barrick uh, operated, when they were doing direct shipment of the ore, the cutoff grade was an ounce per ton. And then when they built the mill in 1998, they were able to drop the cutoff grade to 15 grams per ton. So uh, again, remember, this was an underground mine. So the twist that we brought to this is to look at it as an open pit, and we're able to drop those cutoff grades down to you know, 0.7 grams per ton. And lo and behold, a mine that many people thought had been mined out has 4 million ounces of reserves here at uh, a grade of, of around 4 grams per ton. It's a really spectacular grade for an open pit. The other, other uh, uh, point I'd like to emphasize is that two-thirds of our reserves are in the proven category. And I think for, for open pit uh, operations that haven't yet started mining, that's, that's an unusual situation to have that, that close of drill spacing where you have that high uh, percentage of, of proven versus probable reserves. We put out a feasibility study last fall and uh, using $1,700 gold, $19 silver, that was our base case. The project generates an after-tax IRR of 50%, one-year payback on capital. The average annual after-tax cash flow from this project will be approaching 300 million Canadian dollars per year. Uh, truly uh, a spectacular economics for this project. But I love to highlight that if you go down in pricing to say $1,500 gold, this project still has a 41% after-tax IRR, it still has just over a one-year payback on capital. So to me, that, that means it has margin of safety. This is a project that's very low on the cost curve. You can see all in sustainable costs of around $650 US uh, per ounce. Uh, so it's a project that's gonna be built, even if the price of gold dropped to 1,200 bucks, this would still be a very profitable project. Of course, you can go the other way, look at our, our higher base case, which now isn't even, uh, is below where the current spot price is, and we've got a 55% IRR, and uh, I personally think we're in for probably uh, higher gold prices in the years ahead, and this project is gonna be a cash printing uh, machine. Um, along those lines, I just highlight that our market cap today is uh, probably around 550 million Canadian dollars. In the first year of production, this asset will produce 600 million Canadian dollars of after-tax cash flow. So, uh, again, pretty spectacular. CapEx is, is on the bottom right there, uh, 451 million dollars uh, US. So quite, quite a manageable CapEx relative to the, the size of the annual uh, production profile, 352 thousand ounces per year. The one area we're, we're still a little sh uh, short on is the mine life, it's nine years, but uh, we kind of rushed this project through engineering to get it into the permitting queue. In British Columbia, it just, it takes a little bit longer to get projects permitted, so we wanted to get in the queue and, uh, and, and start the, the, the clock on the permits while we continue to do exploration. I firmly believe that every year over the next three years, we should be able to add at least a year of mine life before we get to starting production. So I, internally, I think we believe we can get this up to a 12-year mine life over the next two, two years. This is what the project looks like. You can see the, the uh, open pit on the bottom, bottom left. The waste, uh, waste rock pile is, is the darker pile just diagonally up to the left. Um, one thing I have to point out with this project is, is on, the, on the top, the permitted tailings uh, storage facility. That, we call that Tom McKay Lake. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge advantage to have a facility that um, you know, has been permitted federally and is basically ready to go. As soon as we get our mine permits, we can turn on this, uh, this facility and start putting waste rock and uh, uh, tailings there. 
So if we didn't have this uh, facility existing today, it would add a couple years to our permitting timeline. So big advantage uh, having that there. Yeah, there's a picture of what Tom McKay looks like. So I mentioned that, that we expect to continue adding, uh, adding to the mine, mine life, and, and that's because of the exploration that we've been doing. Uh, the last resource we put out, uh, which went into the feasibility study, is, is somewhat dated. It was about two years, two years old today. So we've been doing exploration and discovering new zones around the, the pit. So the pit's going to get tweaked, it's going to get expanded, we're going to grab this additional material and it's going to add to the, add to the mine life. Uh, I'll show you, you know, some of the drill holes that we've been putting out over the last uh, 12 months. You know, here's an example. It's a cross section. The uh, yellow orange uh, blobs are the existing reserves, and you see on the left side the gray areas. Those are new zones that we're that we're hitting, and you can see the gray is pretty spectacular. Uh, the top intercept is is 47 grams over uh, looks like 12 meters. The intercept just beneath that, 20 grams over 24 meters. And, and you see that's an area that was waste rock, and now we're turning it into ore. So when we do the feasibility study update uh, later this year, we're going to grab all that material and add to the reserves, add to the mine life, and improve the overall economics of, of a project that already has spectacular economics. Yeah, there we go. You can see those. Probably the, this slide here is, is, is the uh, aspect of the company that I'm most excited about. This is the, uh, you can see the existing deposit right there in the, uh, in the orange, and uh, it's bounded by faults on either side. And I had old home, I had former home stake geologists tell me that the true prize here was to figure out what happened to the deposit when it pinched off going down to depth. You can see that up on the top right. And our theory is that it got faulted off. And the, uh, uh, when it was mined, Barrick mined a, a horizon that's called the contact mudstone. That's the horizon that ran two and a half ounces per ton. And just to give you a little bit of, of like uh, illustration of how this deposit was created, it's a VMS. It was uh, created on the, on the ocean floor. Basically, it had cracks in the ocean floor, and the pressure of the ocean is forcing water down into those cracks. They hit sort of molten rock. They heat up, turns the steam, and it, uh, 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 metals dissolve into those fluids, and they come rushing back up through those cracks. When they hit the cold ocean floor, temperature and pressure come down, and those metals precipitate out on a layer on the ocean floor that was the exhalative event, and that's the contact mudstone. That's what Barrick mined out. What was left is uh, the rhyolite, the area just underneath the contact mudstone, where there was a recirculation of fluids and, and mineral deposition, that's that four gram material. That's the material that's left that we're mining, that we're going to mine in that open pit. So now you understand the deposition, how it occurred. When you, our, our theory is that the contact monsoon continues and got faulted off, and it's potentially that gray area there. So when I show you this drill hole that we drilled, that's a 600 meter step out, 800 meters down. We intersected the contact mudstone and the rhyolite. The rhyolite's that area underneath, and we got four grams over 32 meters. That's the feeder structure, is what that is. That's the, the cracks that the fluids were coming up. Then they hit the, uh, you know, the ocean floor, they exhaled, but the, the key is you gotta find the feeder structures, you gotta find the vents, and then you have to find where did the material that precipitated out collect. And it depends on the topography of the ocean floor. If you're on an edge, those precipitating metals could float down and they collect in a basin. So this is really important. We found the feeder structure, the system is alive, the next step is to find where did the metals precipitate and collect. So this summer we're going to put 20 holes down deep like this and we are looking for that two ounce material. And if we hit it, it's a complete game changer for this company. Uh, I won't get into too much on the, uh, on the timeline except to say that uh, we're going to start construction this summer in a limited way and build the project over the next two years with the plan to be in production in the uh, first half of 2026. We're also going to be doing project financing uh, later this year, so you just have to stay tuned for that. Having lots of discussions about this, about that now, lots of interest, and uh, 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 stay tuned on those drill results because I think that's really the exciting thing. I'd add that we're going to have an assay lab this summer on site, so we'll have assays coming out very, very fast. It won't be like a three-month 
wait for assay results. So with that, I say thank you for your time today. And uh, thank you, Walter. Okay, thanks.